teachers on strike or withdrawing extracurriculars, the Ontario legislature prorogued, and a Liberal government that might be headed to the polls sooner rather than later. Joining us now for more on the first teacher labour dispute in nine years in Ontario, Annie Kidder, Executive Director with People for Education, Michael Barrett, President of the Ontario Public School Boards Association, Hirad Zafari, Student Trustee with the Toronto District School Board, and Adam Redwanski, Ontario Legislature columnist with the Globe and Mail. We also want to know your thoughts on the ETFO job action, so please, online producer Naveen Vaswani and producer Meredith Martin are hosting a Twitter chat right now. Join the conversation using the hashtag AgendaTVO. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you all again here. Actually, first time for you, I think, Mike, nice that you're here. Let's, um, let me lay this out as what uh, you all know Janet Ecker. She's a former education minister in Ontario when the uh, Conservatives were in power. And she has said once upon a time, here's the fundamental problem. The union says this is a dispute about their rights to collectively bargain issues which they believe are important to their members and their workplace. The government of Ontario says this dispute is about their right to implement public policy which they have been elected to do. They see this very differently. Adam, who's more right? I'm not sure they're not both right about that. That's not a cop-out. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, uh, look, I think everybody knows the government's imperatives here. I mean, they didn't campaign specifically on this last year. Uh, in fact, that was a flaw on the part of all parties, that they didn't really lay out what the sort of coming austerity, which everybody knew was coming, would look like. Uh, but I don't think there's any great secret that uh, the province has a major financial challenge. Uh, they're worried about the credit raters. They're worried about uh, the markets. They're, just wor they're also worried politically what will happen to them if they don't actually try and tackle it. And I think it would be a little naive to expect that they could just, uh, for them to expect that the teachers would just roll over and, and, and accept uh, austerity measures that they don't want to accept. So you can understand where they're coming from. Uh, that being said, I think the teachers have a fairly legitimate complaint um, in that the, gov the way the government approached this seemed to be almost designed to be combative. Um, I think they tried to maybe try and maximize the political benefit of it, or at least try and play to their weakness and turn it into a strength. Uh, and what wound up happening is it created a climate where I think the teachers felt as though uh, they really weren't welcome at the table until it was probably too late, and then there was maybe a little bit of effort to engage them. But uh, I don't think either side is, is wrong in the way they're looking at it. Uh, I think the problem is they missed some opportunities to maybe try and, and find compromise early on in the process. But, Michael, if you cannot, if you look at the same set of facts, but look at them through such utterly different lenses, uh, is there any way... Uh, to kind of make common cause at the end of the day on this thing, because it sure doesn't look like it right now. Well, certainly the uh, bargaining units are, are coming forward and saying if they had the opportunity to be able to have actual negotiation take place, that they may have been able to come to some sort of compromise. So I might suggest then, if that indeed is the case, then there needs to be further dialogue in order to be able to try and reach some middle ground. I wouldn't disagree uh, with Adam being able to say that the, the, the concept of negotiation really didn't take place. It was a document that was put on the table and Actually, I can... Actually a YouTube video that was kind of <laughs> yeah. started it all. I really want to correct. get cheeky about it, yeah. So certainly I would agree. That, I mean I can empathize because I think that our positions with the unions and school boards are not far apart because the school boards weren't also sitting there as part of the negotiation process either. Nanny, if you're looking at this from the outside and you're trying to understand is this an issue about workplace rights or is this an issue about implementing public policy which should be of greater import? Well, actually, I think it's an issue about trying to get a settlement. That's what it should be. And there's a, there's a saying somebody told me that, you know, anyone can negotiate a strike, that it's actually negotiating a settlement that's hard and takes some thought. And I think that, that whatever perspective you're coming from, everybody's objective should have been. And I, and I sort of think the teachers went in assuming they were going to have to negotiate and that they w weren't looking to go on strike initially. But that your objective going in is supposed to be, how do we get a settlement? So what do I give up? What do you give up? How do we make this deal? And I think that you're right, Michael, that, you know, the surprise was, I mean, I remember sitting at the partnership table the day after the first day of negotiations, everybody going, they were really mean. And it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't what we expected at all. Who they'd was been, really mean? That the, 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 what was, you know, they were presented with, here's what you're going to get and we're bankruptcy lawyers and we know how this works and if you can't figure it out we'll you know lock you in a room till you figure it out yourselves. So the government was mean? Well the, the, I think they were surprised that it wasn't a dialogue and it wasn't sort of nice and friendly and it wasn't let's all sit down and work out our problem because I think everybody knew that there was a fiscal 
problem. And some of the unions were saying, you know, we know we're going to end up having to, to freeze our, our wages. But I think the other issue is who, who wasn't there. So that there was this kind of weird thing where school boards weren't there, principals weren't there, um, but they were all rolled into this agreement. There's a lot of other stuff in Bill 115 besides just whether or not the, the rights are there or not. But the rights are a problem. Hey, Rhett, how do you see it? Well, you know what, it's a tough situation just because both sides have good arguments and they're both you know, upset with one another and what's going on. Um, but I think the fundamental problem here is that the students have been given you know, their issues and they've been handed in their classrooms and their school experience what really isn't supposed to permeate into the classroom. Now, we know that negotiations aren't the easiest thing in the world and, of course, with such you know, terrible fiscal times and whatnot, uh, you know, new measures had to be taken. But the fact that you know, student services are being taken away because of it just isn't right. And because we don't have a say in what goes on there because we had no role to play in you know, preventing this from happening, uh, you know, we're just seeing it as, as upsetting for us and the fact that our classroom experience is being jeopardized because of it. Where is your educational career at right now? Well, I'm in grade 12, so you know, I, I'm applying for universities. I have to get my extracurriculars on my resume. I have to get my marks up. I might need extra help for classes. And the extra help is being taken away. The extracurriculars are being taken away. Some teachers have, have even said that reference letters are going to be at jeopardy because of this. And I mean, especially for grade 12 students that want to have a relaxing year, as relaxing as it can be when you're applying for so many different places. Um, it, it, it's so much uncertainty, so much confusion. And it's not at all what you know, an ideal scenario would be for, for a graduating student. When you students are at, what school are you at? I'm at Don Mills Collegiate in Toronto. Okay. When you students are out hiding behind the bushes, sneaking cigarettes at recess time, and you talk <laughs> about, sorry, just not kidding, him. just kidding, not you. <laughs> when, when you talk amongst yourselves as to who you blame for the reason that things are where they're at, who do you blame? Personally, I hope that students aren't blaming anyone because we know it's not a black and white issue. There's so many different factors that came into play. I think a majority of students might be leading towards the teacher's side just because we deal with our teachers every single day. We see the work they put in. We deal with them you know, as coaches, as club leaders and whatnot. And of course, they're telling us their side of the story every single day if they have a chance in their classroom time. Uh, just to give us an idea of what's going on at the Ontario level. And so, of course, as students, you know, we're, we're the front line in the classroom, as are the teachers. And so seeing them every day, we almost sympathize, sympathize with them. But, you know, we also understand that the government had, you know, a, a situation that they, had, they needed to handle. And so, you know, it would be tough to blame anyone in this situation. Adam, do you have any sense about where public opinion is on this? I think there's, a, there's probably a plague on both their houses thing that'll happen at some point if it isn't happening already. Uh, I think if you're a parent or if you're, if you're a student, uh, I think you're likely to just say these guys need to sort it out. They, neither seems all that reasonable. Uh, and I don't think there's much benefit for either side in, in being seen to win that battle because, particularly for teachers, frankly, because the, uh, I don't think people are going to say, oh, these, you know, these poor teachers, let's elect a more sympathetic government toward them. I think, if anything, they're likely to elect somebody who's going to be harder on them. I just want to say also that I think we've focused a lot in the past uh, few days this week on the one-day strikes in, in elementary schools. I actually think that's a relatively minor issue compared to what's happening yeah. in the secondary schools, where you know, you're looking at, at potentially the services being pulled back for months, not just now, but you know, into the new year, because there's no reason, uh, even once new contracts are implemented, those can't continue. Uh, and that is, uh, first of all, that's a problem for students this year. Uh, and there's also a real danger here, I, guess, I suppose, both in secondary and elementary, uh, where some of the stuff that uh, the government, this government, to its credit, has done over the last eight or nine years in terms of really improving the climate in schools and getting teachers a lot more involved in intervention with students who need it, uh, with making sure students don't slip through the cracks, all that kind of thing. Uh, that may be jeopardized. I mean, missing a day of school really is not that big a deal, uh, I don't think. Missing, uh, or missing something that's been essential to improving uh, the way that kids are coming out of our schools uh, and to their entire education experience, I think is a really severe problem. And, and every day that this goes on, there's a chance that it becomes more of a lasting thing than just a bit of inconvenience. And I think that the, it's really, I think you're right, that really the scary part is what happens after December 31st. One day strikes, there are inconvenient, but they are not the end of the world. But extra after December 31st, all the contracts are going to be imposed there can be no more work to rule, but there can still be no more extracurricular activities. We've already lived through a time when high school kids didn't have any for years. And there's a lot of evidence about the impact on their education, on their engagement in school, which leads to them doing better in school. So it, I think the ongoing effect is the part that we should be worried about. What's this going to do to the sort of sense of collegiality in schools, to that sense, which there has been, you're right, built over the years, 
there have been really, really, really positive changes in education. A lot of great work done, particularly in high schools for students who might be at danger of dropping out. And the danger now is that we're going to lose that sense of we're all in this together and we're all going to work as we, hard as we can to make it work. Don't you think that's gone already? Well, I, it, no, I think it could still come back. I think you could, it, it could be repaired, um, but it's, People are very worried. I've been talking to directors and to principals, and to, and they're very worried about a long-term effect, not just the short-term one. And I think that's the one. That's why it's so urgent that we try and find a way right now to go, okay, everybody has to pull back. Everybody's got to sit down, or we're going to do some real damage to the public education Where system. Where do you think uh, public opinion is on this, Michael, right now? Well, I think that, uh, as mentioned already, it's mixed. Um, but I have certainly seen um, a heating up of public opinion just in the last week. Against whom? Against the teachers, uh, against the, the stance that they're taking, particularly from students who are emailing me as, as president of OPSPA, questioning what the impact would be on their education as, as being mentioned. You know, there was a student in Stratford, <coughs> they're protesting. And she's wearing a sign on, you know, the cardboard sign, and it says collateral. I mean, to me, that really signifies what this is about. You know, our students are becoming collateral in this, in this discussion that's not taking place between the minister and uh, the, the unions, and we are certainly being able to impact. When a student feels they're collateral in their education, this is not a good thing. Yeah. It's not healthy. I think you mean collateral damage. Collateral. They're collateral yeah. in the sense that they are, they're the one who are being damaged by this. Huh. And I believe the line in the sand is December the 31st. When yeah. the minister acts and puts in Bill 115, I believe that we may not be able to go back. We spent eight years building, building this environment. And December 31st, I think, will mark the line in the sand. Do your teachers in your classes spend time talking about this? They do, they do, especially when this was you know, early on in the school year when you know, there was so much uncertainty. Uh, they would spend a few minutes just explaining, you know, this might happen. My soccer coach would tell me, you know, mid-season we may have to stop. Um, but do they say things like, boy, that premier is being a total jerk and here's why? Do I they personally, say like that? They, they have not to me at least, right? And I'm not sure, you know, what they're saying. Of course, they're maintaining their professionalism. They're not going to be bashing they the are. government. Um, but at the same time, you know, of course, you know, you can feel in their emotions that they feel as though they've been cheated, right? And as a student, we, you know, we're, we're, we're taking that in and we're understanding that this is a bad situation and they're not content at all with, what, with what's going on. And I think it's really important that when we watch what happened with the high school teachers who actually, you know, their leaders negotiated a settlement and then they, their rank and file voted against it, that they seem to be voting against it because of the bill, not actually because of what was in the deal, but mm -hmm. it's like we're not going to settle for this because we're against Bill 115. What and part it, of it do they hate the most? Um, the part about taking away the right to strike, not allowing arbitration, not allowed to go to the Labor Relations Board, not allowed to you know look and see whether or not it violates human rights codes. There's pretty more than one part of it. Heavy-handed. Well, it's all the part within the rights. It's all in one section of the bill, and it's it's pretty amazing when you read it. You go, wow, I didn't know you could do that. Did the government overreach? I think it did to an extent. I think, look, I think part of the problem is, is the legal fight, and part of it is the, is the tone of the thing. And I think yeah. one of the issues I think they have is. The government has put out so much messaging to say uh, this has to be, I think the word in the bill is substantially identical. Mm -hmm. um, and that every deal that has to be substantially, substantially identical to the deal that OECTA reached um, uh, last spring. The, the Catholic problem, teachers. The, Catholic teachers. Mm -hmm. the problem there is that I think there's a sense among teachers, even if there are some compromises, of which there are or some, some negotiated settlements, that well, we're still getting the shaft here because this is... Uh, you know, this is just what the government said all along. They're only going to ram deals down our throat that are exactly the same. So it's hard. I mean, union leaders don't have to worry that much about how the general public feels. They have to worry about their membership. And the problem here is that it's not easy right now for them to convince their membership if they want to, which I think the high school teachers may want to, uh, their leadership mm -hmm. may want to. Yeah. It's not easy to convince teachers that they're getting a decent deal after the government has pretty much telegraphed uh, that they're not really willing to move. This and there are no settlements in any boards, Catholic or French or public. So nobody settled. No, I mean, I think some people think, oh, the Catholic ones are all doing it. Why can't everybody else? They haven't settled either. 
Well, explain that. What do you mean? Because because the school boards themselves are going, we don't want to sign this deal. They have problems with other parts of Bill 115 <laughs> where they go, this is being imposed on us. We're really worried about the teacher hiring parts in it and the stuff about uh, student assessments. So Catholic boards, and there are some even Catholic locals going, we don't like this deal either. So it's not as if some people are going, this is all fine. Why aren't you doing this? There's only one board with one settlement. It's a public board with their high school So teachers. when the Premier, as he did again this morning, mm -hmm says things like, we already have the Catholic teachers on board, we have another Francophone on, Franco-Ontarian yeah. board that's on board. Yeah. Not but they true? haven't actually settled, so they haven't actually voted, ratified, and settled in any boards except the upper ground board with the high school teachers. No, that being said, the, the Catholic teachers clearly were more willing to compromise on this. They and, were. And yeah, I mean, absolutely. there's, no, there's yeah. no real labor issue there. There's not an issue. They're not, you're not going to see job action on their part. So no. that is why they're able to hold that up. And for um, all intents and purposes, the, those are settlements. And uh, though trustees and being in that relationship with uh, uh, separate school trustees, they too are concerned with the governance mm -hmm. issues yeah. on school boards not being involved. We are the employer. We're not at the table being able to be part of that settlement and that discussion. Because it does go down to the methodology by which they chose to be able to um, um, put this bill on the table. Typically, to the point earlier, we would have come into a room and be able to discuss. That was the provincial framework that we had in the last collective agreement, and that was not the, the modus operandi when we came in to be able to discuss that. This is the bill, this is what you should accept, this is what we want. So not only were school boards upset about not being able to be part of that, I can well understand why the unions were not happy about not being part of that. Each Minister of Education has changed the rules of the game as they come in to be able to negotiate contracts. Since 1996, every single Minister of Education has come up with a different solution, whether you're Kennedy or Ecker to, to reference that, uh, whether you're uh, Broughton or whether you're Dombrowski. Each one has done it differently. We've been advocating very strongly for give us the rules of the game and the playing and the process so we understand when we walk into this room, we understand what our roles are and what we're responsible for. The process that's taken place with Bay City, Bay Street lawyers saying this is what's good for education is unacceptable and has certainly riled not only the teachers but also school boards too. We do not support Bill 115 in taking away our rights as an employer. Adam, do you have any idea why after essentially, I don't think I'm overstating this, giving the teachers and their unions almost everything they wanted for eight straight years, the government did this virage? Yeah, the Liberals would take a bit of issue with the everything they wanted, and I suppose the teachers would too, that in the <laughs> early years... Uh, uh, you Everything's know, in, relative. Yeah, and in, when, when they first came with George Kennedy, I think there was some, some tougher negotiation, but it was done in a way to try to build goodwill. Um, look, I think it's a fiscal situation. I think there's, uh, they're looking at, at the realities right now and saying, well, we have to get this done. We don't have room for wiggle room. And politically, uh, these guys are, we're going to get in huge trouble uh, if we're seen to be coddling these folks, because people in the private sector and you know, most workers in the province feel, feel as though they've been hit pretty hard. Now, I think, I think they overdid it, and I think part of it, you, know, you mentioned the YouTube video, which was definitely a mistake, even more Just so a mistake. Just explain what that was for those The Premier putting out a, communicating with teachers mm -hmm. via a YouTube video, uh, which was sort of clearly a messaging exercise when the whole thing launched. Uh, I think even a bigger uh, mistake, uh, clearly, was, was during the by-election in Kitchener-Waterloo, which could have given the Liberals a majority, and they, they pretty much openly campaigned against teachers. And they'll kind of deny that now, but, you know, the literature that they put out uh, was very clearly uh, anti-teacher, and it was trying to really drive a wedge. And that, in terms of a tonal thing, I mean, it's one thing to say, well, circumstance dictates we do this, uh, but I think there was also a more cynical calculation of, look, you know, we're, we're, we're going to lose some of our base doing this. We might as well just give up on that. Uh, and try and build a new base and try and build new support uh, by sort of eating the Tories' lunch and going in that direction. And, and it didn't work. Uh, but I think that's, that's where the other calculation came in, is trying to turn, as I mentioned before, trying to turn a weakness into a strength. I'm going to follow up on the political angle in a second, but again, I want to take advantage of the fact that you're actually in the classroom and you have face-to-face uh, -face discussions with teachers all the time. Do you, the, teachers have told us, and, uh, union leaders have been here, teachers have told me, we understand times are tough. We understand after getting 3% a year, year after year after year after year, in a world where inflation's running at one or two, we understand we've done well, so we understand the need for 0% plus 0%. Do you think they really do? Well, you know, what I think personally is that this whole issue, if they were willing to accept the wage freeze, wouldn't have came up the way that it did. And with that in mind, it's a matter of, you know, back in the early stages, if, you know, 
uh, the union leaders were willing to say, we're going to accept the wage freeze, but don't jeopardize our sick days and the other benefits, then there may have been some room for negotiation. But then when I speak to you know, uh, teachers about that, they say, well, the government wasn't willing to negotiate on that front. So they wanted only what they put in, on the table, and that's it. And there was really no room for negotiation. If that is the case, then there's you know, a fundamental flaw with this, with, this, with this situation, and that is that collective bargaining was jeopardized. Right? So, so they would have taken zero, zero, but don't mess with our sick days. That's basically what I'm hearing from a couple of my teachers. Hmm. Okay. Now I want to pick up on the political angle. We, we saw the last time <coughs> this movie played out this way, uh, which I guess was in the early 1990s. The, uh, the teacher unions did not like David Peterson, and they campaigned hard against him, and then they got Bob Ray, who abrogated collectively bargained agreements. They didn't like him, so they got Mike Harris, and they really didn't like Mike Harris at all. And guess uh, what I'm wondering here, Andy, why don't we start with you on this? <coughs> you know, if you don't like dealing with the liberals who've given you, again, admittedly, not everybody's going to like my characterization of this, but almost everything you wanted over the last eight years, it, do you need to find a deal here? Because if you don't, you're going to end up with Tim Hudak in three months, four months, five months' time? Yes. Do they not see that? Uh, well, I, I think so. I think there's sometimes what's hard in this is exactly what you said, that there's, there and I'm not you know, talking about evil union bosses here, but you're running a union, you have to get elected, you have to you know, look strong and tough. And so that sometimes there's a bit of a disconnect between what you have to do to be a leader of a union, which you do have to do, and you have to fight for your members' rights, and what you have to do to be a smart political negotiator in a way. And there is a lot of, there's a ton of politics in education, up and down and sideways. And so it is really important for the, and it's hard right now, I think, because there's a kind of, they're kind of backed into a corner and now they're defending their rights, which is understandable. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to do both things at the same time. I'm gonna defend my rights, but also I'm gonna really think about the politics of this and I'm gonna be smart, not cynical, but you know, political in a, in a smart way. And I'm not sure they're very, they've been very good at doing both things at once. And the danger is, you know, what the public thinks, how you deal with the political aspect, that you're, you end up in danger also, both sides of kind of backing themselves into corners. And nobody has an exit strategy and nobody seems to be very being very smart about sort of thinking through what's going to happen next. Are we going to end up in a situation where we have an election, the teachers are all going to work against the present government? And I think it is really important to remember it has been pretty great for the last few years in education in, in a real way. Really important, good, strong changes have been made. So it, it to me it goes back to how you make the decision in, to begin with, to sort of enter the fight this way and I've been interested in watching the negotiation with the doctors because I actually think in that case there was more willingness to sit down and go here's the this is the answer we have to get to let's figure out a way together of getting to the same answer and I'm not sure that was offered to the teachers in the same way and I think the high school teachers did try to say okay we you want to get to this amount of money we can get you there but we can you know take some of your unfunded liability as off we can do it in a different way and so it's watching the doctor one that I go why couldn't we have done that in in education and maybe yeah. more political smartness on both sides. No, I was going to make the same, yeah. same yeah. comparison, actually. And it's yeah. funny, because the premier, I think, today mm. said, well, you know, yeah. the doctors were able to, that, to come yeah. back to the table. Teachers should be able to. The Do difference doctors is... Doctors didn't have an axe over their heads. Well, no. I mean, the doc they did in a sense, but they also had a lot more wiggle room, right? They I mean, the thing is, the way that, yeah, the yeah. Way that, that was structured... Uh, yeah. And look, part of that is the nature of the agreement. I mean, doc, the, the Ontario Medical Association is a giant, sprawling organization with all kinds of different specialists built in. So there are more different groups, and it's easier to say, okay, we don't want to do this, so let's take a little yeah. bit from here and move it over yeah. here. Teachers aren't like that. I mean, that's right. not, it wasn't as easy. That being said, you think when you go into this kind of thing, you would leave yourself room for a give or two. Take class yeah. size as an example. I mean, that would be one area where the government said immediately that's off the table. Should have said that, or should have said initially, that's one thing we may have to do, we'd rather not. But, you know, it's room where so you just could... Just understand, you're saying in negotiations they, they could have said, look, if you don't give us what we need, we're going to have to increase class <laughs> exactly. size. Exactly, and there, are, and there are some unions that might actually accept that over other things. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, there's, there's room for that. But the government really narrowed its field of options going in, especially after the Catholic deal where it says, well, everything has to be substantially identical to this. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's really not much room to give a, some kind of compromise that a leader can go back to their, to their union with. Uh, to your question about uh, whether they're... they're it's a foolish strategy on the union's part. They're certainly playing with fire. I mean, look, they're, they're looking at the landscape and thinking, well, hopefully, come end of January, there's a new premier, a new liberal premier, who's maybe more yeah. willing to 
to bargain, and that would, or, or to give some confessions back, or to reopen this, or whatever. They're certainly all uh, sounding that way today, aren't well, they? Well, it depends which one you listen to. I mean, uh, other than Gerard Kennedy, none of them are really saying that they would go quite that far. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that does give some incentive to the unions to keep doing job action in January. If they don't, there'll be no incentive at all for the, for the new premier to do that. Yeah. But they're looking at that. Then they're thinking, well, if not that, um, maybe the NDP wins power in the spring, uh, and they would do this. Uh, the obvious question here is, you know, if you were to bet, there's a pretty good chance of the Tories winning power in the next few months. Uh, and the more they feed into this, you know, look, if, if other parties do line up as the defenders of the teachers, say the NDP, and the Tories win instead, uh, there's going to be absolutely no disincentive for them to go very hard at this. Michael, do you think the teacher unions appreciate the fact that while they would hope to have a better deal with a new premier, liberal, while they would hope to have a better deal with a potential new Democrat government, they could very well get a majority Tory government, and that won't be more to their liking. Well, and, and I, I wouldn't want to align with any political party, but I think that sometimes it's better the devil you know than the devil you don't. <laughs> and uh, Tim Hudak has been pretty clear on what he would expect to be able to do. He has been quite clear on his party's policy, and I would dare suggest that, um, you know, similar to the point that you raised earlier when they uh, unions, you know, uh, put up opposition to Bob Ray. Um, I'm not so sure that what followed was really nirvana and utopia, so it hasn't occurred. And, and back to the, the, the comment with regards to being able to have some wiggle room, um, you know, I'm not going to defend the Minister of Education, but she did allow some, some agreements to be able to be approved, but it was also the OSSTF that changed their mind on being able to go forward with that. That wasn't necessarily local unions voting down those agreements. It was as much as a political strategy, I believe, to say that local agreements damaged their ability to be able to challenge Bill 115 in the courts. So there was some wiggle room. I'll give the minister credit. She did wiggle on a couple of things. Certainly OBSPO was pushing for class size, uh, change in the class size, because we saw that as an opportunity. But the landscape changed very quickly when local OSSTF started to be able to vote down the agreement. Hmm. And that's when, you know, it all stopped. It all stopped. Yeah. Now, the Premier did say today, there's still 20 days left in December. <laughs> and do I believe there's going to be an agreement by the, by the end of December? Yes, but I believe in Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, and the Tooth Fairy. <laughs> there is not going to be an agreement by December the 31st. And what happens, to Annie's point, is going to, the important thing is what happens on January yeah. the 1st. <laughs> You, what are you, 18? I'm 17. 17 years old. So basically for almost all of your sentient life, the Liberals have been in power in Ontario. Yes. Since you were probably eight years old or something yeah. like that. Okay. Do, again, do you and your teachers or do you and your fellow students ever talk about the possibility of there being another party in power yeah. and what the education system might look like if that happened? I, I'm not sure about, I mean, we haven't had these discussions yet, but what I do know is that in the past nine years that the Liberals have been in power, there have been great conditions for teachers. My own teachers are telling me that. And I think the issue is very much relative as well because they've enjoyed, you know, fantastic uh, benefits and whatnot in the past nine years. And then now when times have reached, you know, the peak of, of, uh, of financial hardship, you know, they had to take away a lot of the stuff that they've been given in the past nine years. And that's where the problem comes is because, you know, if it was a gradual increase, it'd be easier for you to stop. But when it was, you know, such a huge, uh, like a beneficial, beneficial situation for them, it comes as a shock. Now, I'm not sure how other parties would, would, would take this situation. I've heard you know, different things from different premiers, uh, if elected as, as the Liberal premier, uh, that they would do this differently. But another party might just give them an even worse deal. And then you know, there'd be even less negotiation for them. And of course, this Liberal party has been a little lenient, but who knows what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, Annie, let me put this to you. We, st we have started to see some musing that these day-long rolling walkouts mm -hmm and an end to extracurriculars could go on for two years. Look into your crystal ball. Where is this all going? I don't think the day-long walkouts are going to go on for two years because they're not allowed to. I mean, there are going to be contracts imposed, and it's going to be a law. There are big fines. There's huge consequences for going against those contracts. But the other stuff could go on. And I mean, I remember talking to kids who graduated after four years of no extracurricular activities long ago in the mid-90s. And they said they were so happy to be out of a high school, they'd had a terrible time. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that you go, we don't want to go back to that. That, that is horrible for students. And it's real. I mean, our organization is there to kind of, you know, make public education work. We think it's really important. It's really bad for public education. It's bad for public confidence. It's bad for everybody's kind of faith that we know what we're doing. What so, does your experience tell you about whether or not 
parents will take their children out of the public system and look for private <coughs> alternatives. Well, only some parents can do that anyway. I think that what ends up happening is you kind of hunker down and figure out how to make it work just for your kid. So you go, we're going to make it work in our school, we'll fundraise, we'll volunteer more. But then that really, uh, you know, adds to the kind of inequity where some kids are going to have way more than other kids. And that's one of the reasons that extracurricular activities are so important is that they're, they're there for everybody. It doesn't just depend upon whether you're rich or poor. So I think everybody should now be thinking about the kind of long game. Um, and everybody should be thinking about what they're going to do in January, January and not hoping, hoping that Santa Claus is going to come and just make it all better because that's no party is going to suddenly make it all, all better. We are in a reality now. And I think that, that that's what people should be talking about now is what's going to happen in January? What are you going to do? Is everybody just going to go, okay, we're going to, everything's going to be back to normal. We'll just wait for the court case. Those kinds of court cases take five years. Years, yeah. yeah. You, you got kids, yes? I do. How many kids you got? Six. And they were That's presumably in school during the... Yes, I still have two in high school in grade 11 and 12, and my oldest daughter experienced yeah. the two years of no extracurriculars uh, in Durham. And why Durham? Because Janet Ecker was from Durham, and, and therefore the, the political attention was paid to the Durham board. And when we sit around the dinner table, my daughter still talks to this day about how she went two years without extracurriculars. And now when we talk about it, I got 111, grade 12, similar circumstances, very concerned on what that means. What when did it mean to your, to your daughter who went through it? My daughter, she's a sports fanatic, unlike myself. <laughs> um, she could have probably answered questions for you. But for her, it was about being able not to be engaged in school. And if you look at the grade 9 and 10 when she wasn't engaged in sports, she was no longer engaged in school in grade 11 and 12 hmm. because she had yeah. already set the, the tone and the, the methodology by which she was going to be engaged. And what did we do as parents? Of course, engaged her in all the extracurriculars in pieces outside of school. So it cost but you a lot more money. It cost a lot more money, and not all parents are able to be afford that. Education is a great equalizer. Extracurriculars is that opportunity to be able to engage our youth in schools and activities that they don't normally have opportunities for. I'm very concerned about setting up a two-tiered educational, those who can afford to pay for outside and those who can't. We're robbing kids of their opportunity to express and to be the best that they can be. But, and part of it is a problem if you're a teacher's union or federation as they call themselves, there's a, there's a bit of a sort of tension between being a union and being there for the, the, the workers in your union and being professionals who have a different job really to do. So it's, I think it's always been hard and you can really see it in extracurricular activities where suddenly you start going, well, you know, that's a volunteer activity after school. But really, um, most teachers, they are professionals and they see as part of their profession a huge range of things that go, you know, way before school and way after school. But when you get into that bargaining situation, suddenly you, you have to go back to being a, a, a kind of labor union in the more old fashioned sense. Adam, explain this to me. How how do teachers expect to get the public on their side by inconveniencing the pupils and the parents they need to be on their side? Yeah, and I don't think it's even aimed at the public. I think it's aimed at, at the politicians and, and kind of a mutual destruction thing where, um, where the politicians feel enough pressure that they have to cave on it. And that's, again, with the liberal leadership, maybe they're hoping that happens there. I think to bear in mind, and I think, and I mentioned they're playing with fire in, in terms of who they elect, but it's also just in terms of the general public climate that they create. I mean, yeah. we now look back on the Harris era and go, oh, well, the, you know, the schools were a mess then. He got reelected, though, the first time. And that's because there was, I mean, it wasn't just because of teachers, but there was a general sense of people were a bit angry and they felt like uh, the broader public sector was kind of getting what it deserved. And, and we're in a situation here right now where, uh, you know, a lot of people have suffered. I mean, look, at, at my workplace, which is not exactly the, the bluest collar workplace, uh, you know, we had four unpaid days off this year. Uh, you had Ray Days, basically. We had our version of Ray Days. And you know what? I, it wasn't that big a deal to me because, hey, it meant people didn't get laid off. Mm -hmm. uh, and you consider yourself in this climate lucky to be working. And, you know, there's a lot of people who haven't had a pay raise in five years. Uh, they've been frozen. <clears throat> and to then see teachers going out and saying, you know, we're not willing to give up these sick days, which seem to most people to be insane. I mean, whatever your, uh, you know, whatever the, the context of them, just your average person looking at it quickly doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, they really do risk a huge backlash. And I think one of the things that's been positive in the last eight years or so is that largely by the government investing quite a bit, um, they have managed to kind of improve the image of teachers, I think, and there's been a generally good feeling about yeah. it. And there's not a lot of antagonism between teachers and students, teachers and parents. 
Uh, and I think you really risk that, that relationship backsliding. So it is pretty short-sighted to think, well, maybe we can bring down this, um, you know, this government or maybe we can force this government to, uh, to change what it's doing. In the process, you're undoing almost a decade of, of pretty good PR you got. Well, that's my last question. We've got about four minutes to go here, and Dalton McGinty thinks he's got a great story to tell over the past decade on education. And my question is, Michael, to you first, is he still the education premier? He is, because I would definitely say, and again, party persuasions aside, is that I would ask the fundamental question, is public education better off because Dalton McGinty was premier of this province for the last eight years, and as a parent, putting six children through the school system, I would say absolutely public education is better off. But is he wrecking that legacy in his last months in office? That is my concern, because I believe that there is a destruction of the legacy. Um, you can't, the old Stephen Covey phrase, you can't talk yourself out of something you behaved your way into, and he's behaving himself into a corner. Is he still the education premier? He did a lot for education, and we know that for a fact. It's terrible to end off this way, because people may just remember him as you know, the guy that brought so much labor unrest. Um, so I'm not too sure about that, but what I do know is that, you know, to go back to the Harris days, it's better now than it was then, and if hopefully we won't have four years of no extracurricular activities, and I hope that we can end this as soon as possible. Adam, is he still the education premier? There are legacy pieces that are going to remain. I mean, full day kindergarten, for instance, is unlikely <coughs> to get rolled back. Uh, but look, setting aside the flashier aspects of, of, of the premier's legacy, uh, I think his really substantive education legacy is, is stuff that has been a bit under the radar. Uh, you know, improving intervention in schools, improving the relationship between teachers and students, some, some fairly sophisticated stuff that was possible largely because of teachers' goodwill. And I think the danger for him is that we're going to go back to where we were about 10 years ago, where the subtler stuff that he did, which I think is where the greatest value has been, won't be there anymore. So, look, he can certainly boast uh, that kids in the last eight years or so, nine years, uh, got a better education than they might have if he had not been premier. Got the best uh, test scores in the English-speaking world now, and, apparently. And that's something that, you know, you can't take away from him. And if it regresses, well, you know, in his time, it was good. But if they're hoping that these will be lasting changes and to continue building that relationship, I mean, they're, they're, they're still trying to put forward, even now, some ideas of how to improve teaching and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, good luck advancing those right now under the current climate. Any last 30 seconds to uh, Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that one of the biggest things that happened was this incredible sense of partnership so that there, re there were real consultations. Everybody was talking. And is there he was wrecking the legacy? Uh, yeah, I think the worry is, again, what happens next year, and that may wreck the legacy. Okay. Yeah. I want to thank all of you for coming in and helping us with our discussion tonight on Bill 115. Annie Kidder, People for Education. Michael Barrett, the president of the Ontario Public School Boards Association. Adam Radwanski from the Globe and Mail. Hirad Zafari, student trustee, and uh, we got to find a riding for this guy. Hey, he looks good. Oh, yeah. He looks good. <laughs> 18 first, and then he's going to run. 18 first, and then he's going to run someday. All right, well done. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.